All right, uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour and we have a lot of cases to get through this evening. And so I, I think we should probably actually jump right into the content and get started. So uh, with that, um, I'll start things off. Uh, first off, thank you everyone for joining here this next installment with cases with Castle Biosciences. Uh, I'm joined tonight by our, our presenter, uh, Hadas Skepsky, uh, board certified dermatologist and dermatopathologist. Uh, my name is Matt Goldberg. Um, Senior Vice President of Medical here at Castle Biosciences, and uh, really excited to have this uh, fourth installment here of this Cases with Castle Biosciences series. Um, next slide. We've got um, seven cases here tonight that Dr. Skepsi is going to be sharing with us tonight, and so just a couple of housekeeping um, items here. Uh, if you could just keep your mic microphones muted and then raise your hand or kind of send a message to the chat and we can answer those um, either during the uh, discussion uh, in a dynamic way, kind of a back and forth conversation, or we can follow up afterwards and answer any additional questions that you may have. Um, and then these sessions, like the other three that precede it, are going to be posted up on YouTube and will be available for uh, participants to view uh, and others that aren't able to make it after the session uh, is recorded. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the relevant disclosures uh, for the session tonight. Next slide, please. And I just want to take a moment first to introduce Dr. Skupski, um, for who is our speaker and who brought the cases here tonight. As I mentioned, she's a board-certified uh, dermatologist and dermatopathologist. She's a graduate of the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine, where she graduated magna cum laude. She finished her uh, dermatology residency at UC Irvine and dermatopathology fellowship at the Ackerman Academy uh, in New York. Um, and she has worked in multiple settings, as settings as a dermatologist, dermatopathologist, and as the dermatopathology laboratory director at the Laser Skin Care Center of Long Beach. Uh, she's also a dermatopathologist at Compass Dermatopathology and the VA at Long Beach. And she's on clinical faculty at the UC Irvine Dermatology Center, where she teaches dermatopathology uh, to dermatology and to pathology residents on a weekly basis. We're Really fortunate to have Dr. Skupski here with us tonight to share her experience using gene expression profile testing as part of her workflow for diagnosing and getting to clarity for uh, these difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesions um, where standard approaches in histopathology don't get us to full clarity. Uh, that's really critical to achieve clinical pathologic correlation. So as a quick overview about Castle Biosciences, um, Castle has a robust molecular program uh, focused on dermatology. We have a range of molecular diagnostic tests that span from the diagnostic ancillary test, my path, which will be the focus of the conversation tonight. It's intended to aid in the diagnosis and management for patients with ambiguous melanocytic lesions. And then we have two prognostic tests for impactful cutaneous malignancies, the decision DX melanoma test for a prognostic test for patients diagnosed with cutaneous uh, melanoma, and the decision DX SCC test, for another prognostic test for patients with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and one or more risk factors. And this really represents a, a focus on diagnostic and prognostic tests for patients with impactful skin cancers uh, that are, are brought to clinicians uh, from uh, Castle Biosciences. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we're going to be focusing on the MyPath diagnostic ancillary test tonight. And when we think about gene expression profile testing and the range of uh, ancillary molecular diagnostic tests, it's important to think about what our analyte is. What, what are we looking at when we're using these sophisticated techniques to supplement our histopathology review? And many of the modalities that we focus on in our routine derm path practice uh, use immunohistochemistry here on the far right. They look at the proteins that we see located in our tissue of interest. We can identify the presence or absence of a particular protein, relative intensity, through a subjective review of our immunohistochemical stains that we optimize in each of our laboratories independently. On the far left, we have DNA-based tests that we're also familiar with. So these would include FISH or array CGH uh, or next-generation sequencing or SNP arrays. These are looking at gains or losses of entire arms of chromosomes in some instances or particular point mutations that tell us a little bit about the mutational status of the lesion that's submitted for testing. In the center here where we're focused tonight is where RNA, the products of transcription, where we're looking at you know, independent of the mutational status, what are the transcripts? What is the mRNA content of a particular lesion? And the transcriptional regulation can include mutations, but also uh, non-mutation, not non-mutational changes, um, such as epigenetic changes that can really relate to some of the 
transcription products, looking at the RNA that's expressed in the tissue. And so gene expression profile testing is really focused in the center uh, column here of RNA-based tests. Next slide. And for gene expression profile testing for this application for the diagnosis of cutaneous uh, melanocytic neoplasms, what we're looking for is patterns of gene expression in different types of lesions. So here are the image on the left, a benign nevus, and the image on the right, an invasive cutaneous melanoma. We're looking at the the actual neoplasm, the atypical melanocytes, but also the microenvironment around those atypical melanocytes, looking at the pattern of gene expression in groups that are diagnostically different, benign nevi and malignant melanomas, and looking to see if it's possible to identify a pattern of gene expression that's more similar to benign nevi or malignant melanomas, and then testing lesions that clinicians submit for testing to identify whether or not their lesion is more similar to a benign nevus or malignant melanoma really looking at patterns of gene expression within the tumor of interest that's best interpreted in the context of the other clinical histopathology and other laboratory information that you know about the patient. Next slide. And so gene expression profile tests uh, like my path are developed through this um, pathway of discovery where you look at a large group of target genes that are selected from the literature that provide the most difference between the categories of interest. In this case, genes that are differentially expressed in uh, benign nevi and malignant melanoma. This group of genes is whittled down in the process of discovery and then training, leading to a locked algorithm where a pattern of genes and gene targets are identified and incorporated into a locked algorithm, which is then validated on a completely independent group uh, of lesions to see what the performance of the test is. This can be subsequently evaluated in further performance studies, looking at how the test performs in multiple different cohorts. And my path has gone through this rigorous development, training, and validation. Next slide. I want to spend just a quick moment here before we get to the cases about how my path is actually run in the laboratory. And this is a standard operating procedure or SOP that's followed for all of the formalin fixed paraffin embedded based tests here at Castle Biosciences. In the top left, we start with a signed test requisition form submitted by a treating clinician who sends the test to Castle Biosciences laboratory. The tissue is then requested and a board certified dermatopathologist will review the tissue for the presence of tumor content, meaning that if there's no tissue remaining on the slide, the test can't be run and the area of interest is uh, abstracted and identified either by the pathologist who sends in the case. In the case of my path, you can dot or mark the slide or derm path will circle the area of interest and make sure that there's enough tumor to perform testing. Uh, paraffin is removed um, and RNA is extracted from the unstained sections that are submitted for testing. RT-PCR takes place, meaning you quantify the target genes of interest in the locked algorithm. The algorithm is then applied and a result is issued to the treating clinician that returns the result not of one particular gene, but of the validated score that's the output of the MyPath melanoma test or decision DX melanoma or decision DX SCC test. Here for MyPath melanoma, we're looking at a group of discriminant genes and reference genes that's passed through this classification algorithm to get one of three scores. A gene expression profile test suggestive of a malignant neoplasm or suggestive of a benign neoplasm or an intermediate score. And this again can aid in clarifying the diagnosis between a benign nevus and a malignant melanoma, which can inform subsequent management decisions that will really, I think, be highlighted in this format of a case discussion here with Dr. Skupski today. The pathway of development and validation is outlined here in the manuscripts listed on this timeline. If there's any of these manuscripts that people have questions on, we can follow up offline and answer any questions you have about the analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility that's been published for the MyPath melanoma test. Suffice it to say, it's a well-validated test. as a range of um, support in the published literature, and the base of the support leads to um, really a sense from multiple uh, guidelines as well as appropriate use criteria committees that identify gene expression profile testing as one of the diagnostic ancillary tests that can be used when the tools of histopathology lead to uh, an equivocal diagnosis. Uh, to, if the purpose of the test is to help inform a diagnosis of a benign nevus or a malignant melanoma, and some of the more detailed references are included here in the text. So again, the strength of the evidence, I think, leads to uh, the inclusion of gene expression profile testing as one of the molecular diagnostic tests that is available when this particular clinical question comes up in our practice. And with that, I'd like to turn uh, the, the uh, webinar over to Dr. Skupski to really highlight uh, these seven cases that uh, you brought for us um, to discuss here tonight and, and look forward to the conversation. 
All right. Thank you so much for inviting me to share these cases with you. I'm excited to show kind of how I've used the test to help my decision making um, as a dermatologist and dermatopathologist. The first case that I'm presenting is actually my own patient. This is an 18 year old male with an irregular pigmented macula on the chest. So th this first case is the only one I'm presenting that's my own patient. You know, I look at hundreds of specimens a week as biopsies. I only have two half days of clinic. So the vast majority of things that I look at are not my own clinical work. Um, but I find that as a derm, derm path, it's especially hard to be objective when it's my own patient. Um, and so that adds a little bit of a degree of difficulty to this case. I've been following this 18 year old man uh, since he was 10 years old. Uh, I see his whole family, mom, dad, sister, brother. So he's here for his routine skin exam. And I see this on his kind of chest shoulder area. And I know that it did not have this atypical feature before because I always take dermoscopy photos when I see atypia to monitor over time. And so um, I took a dermoscopy photo and a measurement. I gave him the option, do you wanna watch this or biopsy today? He chose to watch it and come back. When he came back eight weeks later, he was actually seen by my colleague who biopsied this lesion. So he is uh, somebody that has a history of dysplastic nevi um, and a family history of melanoma in an uncle. He is on his high school surf team. He's an avid surfer, teaches surf school in the summer. So lots of sun in his life too here in sunny California. This is his um, biopsy specimen. And we can see here on the H&E that the lesion is a fairly broad, poorly circumscribed, and asymmetric. Looking closer, in the middle, there's kind of a bland nested uh, nevic component. So these are bland dermal melanocytes that I'm not worried about. But at the junction around it, we have kind of a more atypical proliferation of melanocytes. Some of these melanocytes are enlarged with um, kind of irregular uh, sizes to the nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and um, there's uh, some areas where the proliferation becomes a little bit more confluent. Um, and here I just wanted to show that um, it's becoming so confluent at the junction in some foci that we're almost getting like a hint of a zipper sign. Um, what I call the zipper sign is something that we see in melanoma in situ sometimes when the junctional melanocytes become so confluent that they start to kind of separate in this ragged way like a zipper separating. Uh, so, you know, this is concerning. Um, and then we have um, some areas of pagetoid scatter as well. Here we have a pagetoid melanocyte way up in the granular layer where it does not belong. So this just kind of describes my pathology report. My pathology report at this point, I'm not ready to make a diagnosis. I need some more information. So my first step is always going to be IHC, um, immunohistochemical studies, to get a better look at the cells of interest. So here we have a MART stain, and we see on low power that the MART is again confirming on the asymmetry of the lesion, that it's broad, that it's poorly circumscribed. Looking closer, we see that um, over the area of the bland uh, dermal component, it looks somewhat organized, it's not terrible, but then away from this area, there are areas where the nests become more disorganized. There's a lot of single cell and again, some pagetoid scatter, including um, some nested melanocytes that are pagetoid here. This is a prame stain. And um, before we look at the prame in our tissue, I'd like to point out that we always have a same slide control in my lab for prame. Uh, which is important. So this is um, the control slide is showing melanoma in situ. So this is what every, you know, there is lab to lab variability in IHC. So you need to kind of know your stain in your lab. Uh, this is what a positive frame looks like in my lab. This is melanoma in situ, lentigo malignant type. And we see this confluent proliferation of uh, positive nuclear staining uh, of melanocytes. So that is our melanoma in situ. Now here is our patient tissue. So looking a little bit closer, we see that the dermal melanocytes, which we thought, you know, looked kind of bland, are prime negative, right? It supports that these are pre-existing nevus cells. Um, then when we look at our junctional component, which is more atypical, we have a moderate degree of staining. I typically don't grade um, prime in my own practice, but I'll kind of say if it's weak, moderate, or, you know, really um, diffuse, strongly positive staining. And in this case, it's more of a moderate at the junction, um, not quite as red as our control. So this is where we are at this point with kind of conventional 
um, conventional routine sections and, and IHC stains, right? So we are, have a compound melanocytic proliferation that's severely atypical. I'm between um, a severely dysplastic nevus or possibly an early melanoma in situ arising in a dysplastic nevus. Um, again, as both the dermatologist and the pathologist on this case, it is hard to be objective. You know, part of me um, doesn't want to give this kid a melanoma. Um, again, I've been seeing him since he was a little boy. Um, but perhaps there's a part of me that does want this to be a melanoma because as the dermatologist, I get to be the hero and diagnose an early melanoma. But, you know, when caught early, you can be life-saving, right? I don't want to have any kind of non-objective things cloud my judgment. Um, I'm really on the fence about this one. And so I went ahead and ordered molecular testing. And so here is um, the result that I got from Castle for the MyCap. And we see that it came back with a score of positive 1.3, so suggestive of malignant neoplasm. And um, in the end, um, I always give kind of a summary um, in my report of, you know, the final diagnosis, how I arrived to it, you know, with all the components, right? So it's not just this test is telling me it's malignant, therefore it's malignant, but I'm synthesizing all the data. And in this case, this uh, diagnostic result was enough to sway me in the direction when I was on the fence towards an early melanoma in situ. And so uh, this was an early melanoma in situ arising in association with a pre-existing uh, dysplastic nevus. Um, so treatment outcomes, um, I want to talk about that real quick because, you know, in this case, uh, some might say, and I get this a lot from pathologists, what does it matter if you are calling an early melanoma in situ or a severely dysplastic nevus? They're going to cut it out either way. And I feel like as pathologists, right, that's understandable to think that way because the pathologist side, side of me sees all sorts of horrible melanomas under the microscope, right? So deep, invasive, Goomba-type melanomas where there's no question. We see lymphovascular invasion. We see perineural invasion. We see all sorts of things and they're horrible. And those are the real serious cases, right? These we're talking life and death. But there's so many of these in-betweeners, these early ones where saying they're gonna cut it out anyway, I may as well just call it a melanoma inside you. The provider side of me knows that that's not okay. We don't want to be overcalling these lesions. To this boy, the diagnosis matters. So if you diagnose somebody with a melanoma in, with a melanoma inside you, even though it's a stage zero melanoma, he's not going to be able to get life insurance down the line. He now has been labeled with a diagnosis of melanoma, and it's impacted him psychosocially. Right, the psychosocial impact is there. Um, I still see him. And in fact, I've seen some of his friends afterwards from his surf team come to see me now for full body skin exams because he's told his coach, he's told his friends, this is part of his life. So these diagnoses really do make an impact on someone's life, not to mention, of course, that the excision is larger for melanoma inside you margin wise. And you're in a position here because this is your patient that you happen to know that it matters in that context, but it's, yes. I find that in, as you have your you know, pathologist hat on, dermatopathology hat on, you don't often know the full complexity of the clinical scenario. And so sometimes we rely on maybe a, a jolt from a clinical colleague or a note, you know, about a clinician concern that there are cases that may be, may be glossed over as a pathologist that may actually be very impactful in the clinic. And you happen to know in this case, this is something that you might see frequently, but in this case, the distinction really matters for this patient and getting the clarity may be impactful. So I feel like there's a dynamic sometimes if you're not the same person, mm -hmm. you know, the, on the same side that maybe there's some of that dynamism between derm and derm path that could lead to more clarity and, and clear management for the patient as a result. Absolutely. Um, okay, my second case here, this is a 44-year-old male with an irregular pigmented macula on the chest. Um, and so this is the clinical presentation. He has no history of skin cancer. There's a family history of melanoma in a grandmother. And clinically, we see a nine millimeter irregular pigmented macula. So the dermatologist in me looking at these sees all four ABCD criteria of melanoma when we're evaluating an abnormal mole, right? So this is asymmetric. It has B irregular borders. Uh, C, color variegation. So I'm seeing shades of really, really dark brown, kind of white to light pan and medium brown. Uh, and uh, D, uh, diameter. So larger than, nine, than six millimeters or the size of a pencil eraser is more concerning. So it has all four of those criteria. So clinically, very concerning lesion. Of course, it was appropriately uh, biopsy. And here is our shaved biopsy. On low power, 
we can kind of see what goes with the clinical that we have this really broad, poorly circumscribed and asymmetric lesion. On one side here, we have a little bit more of a lentiginous melanocytic proliferation, more single celly, small nests at the tips of the reedy. But on the other side, we have more kind of dysplastic features. So irregular disorganized nests, some larger melanocytes with dusty cytoplasm, and concentric fibroplasia around, uh, surrounding the involved reedy ridges. Here, uh, we're seeing a phenomenon uh, called pigmented pseudoperikeratosis, where um, this happens in heavily pigmented lesions in general, and especially in areas where there's rubbing. So if this shirt is kind of rubbing on this, sometimes that can cause some pigmented pseudoperikeratosis, which can be hard or confused with um, pagetoid spread. Sometimes it's important to note that this is not true melanocytes, it's just pigment, but we get stains to kind of check that out further. Okay. So um, this describes what I just told you, and we're gonna look at our stains next. So first up, a mark stain. And our mark confirms what we saw, broad, asymmetric, poorly circumscribed. Poorly circumscribed means it kind of trails off to the edges, right? It's not ending in a clear cut nest. It's hard to say exactly where it ends. Um, then it, this is our more lentiginous area, single cells, small nests. And then our more dysplastic area, right? So more um, bridging of nests, larger, more typical melanocytes, but really not a whole lot of pagetoid scatter. This kind of confirms what we saw where we interpreted as pigmented pseudoperikeratosis. The mark that highlights the cytoplasm of the melanocytes is not sh showing too many cells going very high up. Then we have our um, crane here. And so our prane, you can see this is the lentiginous side and it's fairly negative for prane expression. But then on our dysplastic side of this proliferation, we're getting some prane signaling. So in my lab, the vast majority of you know, benign pranes are completely dead negative. And so here we do see some nucle like nuclei you know, blushing. So this is some kind of mild um, expression of pain. It's there and it's not just you know, in a few scattered melanocytes, it's really in what seems like a clone of melanocytes. It's all of the you know, melanocytes in this atypical area. So could this be an evolving early melanoma arising again in a pre-existing so, nevus? Mm -hmm. So the frame here is kind of you know, echoing the same question that you have for the histopath where you have the tail of kind of two sides of this lesion and your frame staining, you know, you've got it, but it doesn't necessarily answer the particular question that you were looking for, either stone cold negative or booming positive. You're kind of in a equivocal frame zone of some sort. Exactly. That's exactly right. I mean, I would say the vast majority of the times I love frame and I rely on it quite a bit. You know, 90% of melanomas are frame positive and, you know, um, 90% uh, of benign things generally are pretty negative. So it's a very helpful stain, but not a magic bullet by any means. And then we often do get into these, I find when I'm on the fence, histopathologically, if it's not clear cut, sometimes the pain is not that clear cut either, um, as in this case. And so um, we have to kind of keep thinking here. Where am I at this point, right? So we have our routine histopathology, we have our IHC and we have our clinical. So this is one where the clinical, the dermatologist in me is more worried about this lesion than the dermatopathologist in me. Um, clinically, I would be very comfortable calling this a melanoma in a heartbeat. Um, on pathology, I'm getting mixed signals. And again, I don't wanna overcall it. This is a 44 year old person on their chest. The chest is, a, is an area that's prone to keloid. Um, I, you know, I might call this a melanoma today and a severely dysplastic tomorrow. And I want to be consistent here. I want to know that I'm, you know, my result is based on as much objective evidence as possible. So I sent this for uh, molecular testing. And here we see the, the uh, MyPAP score was negative 2.1, suggestive of a benign neoplasm. Um, so I'd like to point out, you know, here's kind of our scale of the MyPAP results. And you can see negative 2.1 is just on the cusp of the benign range and the indeterminate range. Um, so I'm a believer in the lives of lesions. That's kind of an Ackermanian phrase. So Bernie Ackerman, a founding father in dermatopathology, he actually wrote a book called The Lives of Lesions. Um, so, you know, you have to understand that lesions that are biopsied are not static things. These are things that are evolving over time. And I do think that there's a good chance that this lesion is on its way to behaving badly. But because of this result, 
at this point in time, at this stage in this lesion's life, I can say that it's, you know, uh, benign. That doesn't mean though, right? Synthesizing all the data doesn't mean I'm just gonna say benign, leave it alone, right? So my final um, result here is a junctional dysplastic nevus with severe atypia. Given the atypical routine histologic findings, re-excision for complete histologic evaluation to ensure removal is recommended. So I'm saying, I want you to cut this out, make sure it doesn't come back, make sure we see all of it histologically, but I'm not calling it a melanoma. So this 44 year old now does not have the label of melanoma. He can get life insurance. And this is his you know, excision here. So the final uh, wound length was 3.6 centimeters, so under four centimeters. If, uh, and this was excised with a 0.3 centimeter margins. There's no clear cut guidelines on you know, uh, margins for severely atypical lesions. Um, the provider will often kind of do it based on how much skin is available in that area to work with, right? If it's really easy to take an extra margin, sure. But in an area like this where the, um, the closure can be tight, it's prone to keloid, they're gonna take a smaller margin. So they took 0.3 centimeters. Um, and if they had taken one centimeter as you would in a melanoma in situ, um, that would be 1.4 centimeters larger of a defect. Typically, the closure is three times the length of the defect. So this could have been, you know, several centimeters larger, um, you know, up almost double in size, basically, uh, of the wound. And that's, that's a big deal, I think, for this patient. So I feel good that um, I saved a little bit of skin here. Our third case is an 82-year-old woman with an enlarging, or an enlarging pigmented lesion on the cheek. She is a, a retired psychotherapist. She does have a history of melanoma. So if I called it a melanoma, it wouldn't be her first. Um, we know people who have melanoma are at increased risk of developing melanoma. So she has a risk factor. And she has a history of non-melanoma skin cancer as well. And on her cheek, she has this eight millimeter enlarging brown macule. On pathology, we see here a uh, signs of severe sun damage, right? So there's really prominent solar elastosis. And on low power, we don't even see a melanocytic proliferation really here, but we see some basal or hyperpigmentation. And we really need to zoom in close to say, okay, what's the melanocytic situation here? And when we zoom close, we do see, and this is hard for the untrained eye, but we do see that there's just one too many melanocytes at the dermal epidermal junction. Um, and you know, we'll stain this up to, to prove it, but there's just a few too many melanocytes here. And this is a challenging case because um, we are getting into the area of what's called atypical junctional melanocytic proliferation. And um, what that means is too many melanocytes on sun damaged skin. So another kind of dogma in dermatopathology pathology is that um, a broad junctional proliferation on, of melanocytes on sun damaged skin is melanoma inside you until proven otherwise. If you haven't learned this yet, learn it now, it will save you. <laughs> so a broad junctional proliferation, but there's a caveat. On sun damaged skin, we also have a phenomenon of actinic melanocytic hyperplasia. Severe sun damage, as a result, we get this reactive proliferation of melanocytes at the junction. So how do we tell the two apart, right? So then that's the question. And that's often why there's this term atypical junctional melanocytic proliferation, which is kind of in the middle. You're saying, I'm not quite at melanoma, but there's too many melanocytes and I'm worried about this. Unfortunately, what happens with an AJMP is that it tends to get cut out, or treated like a melanoma essentially as for worst case scenario. So I really try to minimize my AJMP calls. I really do as, as much as I can, I try to get as much clarity. So here, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stain it. And um, first up is MART. And so on a MART stain, now at low power with this highlighting our melanocytes, we can really see, yes, there's really quite a bit of uh, an increased density of melanocytes, slightly irregular in their placement. Here we see that there's not quite junctional melanocytic confluence, right? So confluent melanocytes at the junction would be very, very sensitive melanoma inside you. There's not pagetoid scatter, although in lentigo malignant type melanoma, which is what we're worried about here, you often don't get a whole lot of pagetoid scatter. Um, but we do see that the melanocytes are crowded. Okay, so too many of them. Then this area, I apologize, um, in scanning, uh, it didn't scan evenly, so it's a little bit blurry. But there was this one focus where I said, oh my goodness, is that a nest, right? So a nest is defined as three or more melanocytes together. And I count at least two here. 
Um, and that makes a difference because um, AJMP is never uh, is never nested. If if it's nested, it's it's a lentigo malignant. And so to me, this is kind of a very worrisome feature right there. Um, another thing to kind of consider here is that um, this is, if we look at our um, mark here, we see that this proliferation, it's side to side here on the biopsy. And we know that this is a partial sampling um, of a broader lesion on sun damaged skin, right? So the clinical lesion was about um, eight millimeters. We have about four millimeters of biopsy here. So half of this is still on the patient. And we need to figure out from this, you know, does she have um, an atypical junctional proliferation? Does she have melanoma inside you that's brewing? Or could this just be actinic melanocytic hypoplasia? That's, you know, kind of where I am right now. Um, here we have a, um, the prame and our prame here, which by the way, has a nice internal control of a sebaceous gland, our prame is dead negative. So that prame is very reassuring, that's great. But is that enough for me to drop all the other concerning features I had up until this point, the too many melanocytes, the maybe an S, um, and the fact that I'm only seeing half the lesion? I'm still worried. And the question now is, what do I call it? If I call it AJMP, she's gonna have surgery on her face. Um, it's getting near her eye. This is a sizable lesion. Um, so I you know, would love to have something, take me back from the edge here, right? Can I just say that this is okay? And so I sent this for molecular testing. The MyPath score came back negative 4.9, suggestive of benign. So this was enough for, to, for me to step off the ledge, right? Now I, I'm stepping back and I'm gonna say, no, we don't need to cut this woman. We can watch this. So my final report is this. It's a solar lenigo with slight melanocytic hyperplasia. This might be um, kind of a Dr. Skepsky-ism, but it's my call that's a step lower than AJMP, a step higher than just a solar lenigo, which is completely benign. It's a solar lenigo with that component of actinic melanocytic hyperplasia, that atypical proliferation of melanocytes that we see in very sun damaged skin. Could this be a precursor lesion to lentigo maligna? Absolutely, cannot rule that out definitively 100%. And so I'm not saying, you know, leave this, never think about it again. I'm telling the provider, this is part of a broader lesion, but it's okay to watch this. Right now, it looks like it's behaving benign at this stage in its life, right? Let's keep an eye on it. If there's any changes down the line in what's left behind, if it's growing, if it's changing color pattern, um, go ahead and, you know, give me another sample and we'll reevaluate it. So she did not have surgery. This is a great example just where, you know, the clinical impact of the diagnosis, I think, rings out here where you can see kind of how the words we use or kind of where these are placed can be, you know, impacted by the diagnostic clarity, right? And it doesn't mean do nothing here. You've highlighted, right, to increase the amount of surveillance and the derm receiving this is like we're going to watch this lesion, but isn't committing the patient to a surgery that may not, you know, treat a, a malignant lesion that's malignant at this period, but they'll be able to keep an eye on it moving forward. Exactly. So I, I think, I think, you know, this is a win-win for everybody. It's a win-win for the patient that doesn't have to have surgery. It's a win-win for us that, you know, as our care team, that we're not overcalling something, um, you know, and um, ultimately she's still going to get the same, you know, care. We know that lentigo maligna has a long radial growth phase. We have a long time to discover it before it becomes invasive. So I'm comfortable, you know, watching this. And the term AJMP is sometimes called AIMP, I think, right? A atypical junctional, yeah. And I feel like they're used almost interchangeably, but that's that moment where you're on the fence between that kind of benign lentigo versus lentigo with melanocytic hyperplasia like this or melanoma in situ. So it's a it's a situation I think we've all found ourselves in previously. This is a great case. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I found, I found it really helpful in that situation, um, where I wanted to kind of be pulled back and I was <laughs> all right. So this is, um, our next case is a 45 year old female with a pigmented lesion on the back. So this was possibly changing for the patient. I say that because when I looked at the clinical note, she came in with a chief complaint of a mole on her back that she wanted to have checked out. Um, there's no personal or family history of skin cancer. She is a former diver, so she's had some sun in her life. Um, and just for fun, her, her chart has a sticky note that she has um, anxiety and she's nervous about procedures. So she agreed, though, to have this mole taken off. And for me now, as a dermatologist looking at this, because um, this wasn't my patient, but I'm looking at the photo, 
this scares me because I probably wouldn't have biopsied this in, in a patient of mine. I mean, this to me, looking at the ABCD criteria has none, right? It's, it's oval, it's, you know, small, it's symmetric, it's one color. It's really not very worrisome. The only ABCD criteria that it has actually is E, evolution. So the possibility of change, the fact that she said, hey, I think something's going on with this mole here. Um, so this was biopsied. And on pathology, we see um, a fairly a fairly uh, circumscribed and symmetric lesion here, right? So it kind of matches what we see clinically. Circumscribed meaning it ends really clearly in an S. I see exactly where this ends. Um, and as we um, look closer though, we see a very irregular nesting pattern. So, you know, when I'm teaching my residents how to kind of interpret um, nesting patterns in a mole, I kind of make the analogy of when you're looking at an EKG. Um, and this is what I call an irregularly irregular pattern. So the nests, they vary in size and shape. They vary in where they're located. There's kind of no rhyme or reason as to where these nests are organized. Um, in addition to that, some of the melanocytes are discohesive. So we're having areas of kind of clefting. Um, there's areas of kind of horizontal uh, bridging here. So kind of concerning architectural features. When we look up close and personal at these melanocytes, we see, you know, these are melanocytes that only a mother could love. They are really, you know, large, pleomorphic. They've got prominent nucleoli, so much so that it looks like some of the cells are looking back at you, which is never a good thing. Um, and there is a little bit of pagetoid scatter, not a whole lot, but these are some ugly cells. No mitotic figures though. Here's just an area of kind of horizontal bridging, another uh, kind of concerning feature here. And so um, this is one, again, you know, um, histologically very, very concerning, um, clinically kind of scary because it didn't look that bad. We want to get more information, right? So we're going to look at our MART stain. MART here confirms, again, that irregularly irregular nesting pattern, but it does show that it's a fairly circumscribed, fairly symmetric lesion. And as we look up close, there's just focal low-level pagetoid scatter. It's not going really high up towards the granular layer, um, but some low-level scatter, especially in the area where we have those large atypical melanocytes. As we go to our frame, here we have a fairly strong positive frame signal. So pretty much all of the melanocytes here um, have a nice you know, red nucleus. Um, and so this is a frame positive. So let's go back now and, you know, put it all together. On pathology, we have a lesion that's fairly, you know, small and circumscribed, but markedly atypical cytologically and, and you know, with some architectural disorder. Um, it's prime positive. Um, but here, the main reason I got the test was the battle between the dermatologist in me and the pathologist in me. <laughs> so the dermatologist in me is like, no way, this cannot be a melanoma. The pathologist in me says, this looks like a melanoma. If it was twice as broad, right? If it was twice this spread um, in an, you know, an older patient, much more sun damaged, I wouldn't think twice to call a melanoma, obviously. But this is, you know, a small, circumscribed, nothing looking lesion. Can this be a melanoma? And so I ordered the, the test to see if it could make me step away. And it did not. So it came back as positive, positive 0 0.2. So very low positive score, but positive means malignant um, or suggestive of malignancy. And so this was enough to push me to make the call to say, okay, despite that the dermatologist in me thinks that this looks like nothing, um, this lesion, whatever the patient noticed about this, she was right because this lesion is molecularly on a RNA expression level, it is expressing genes in common with what in a large cohort of studied benign and malignant lesions matches more with malignancy. So I'm confident to say that despite the fact that this look doesn't look awful, we are catching a very early melanoma here, um, a melanoma in situ. And so um, we made the call and she had it excised as melanoma in situ. Next case is a 22 year old with a pigmented lesion on the right cheek. So this is, this young lady is a college senior. She's studying nursing. Uh, the spot has been present for many years. She said it has two little spots, but recently enlarged and became darker. There's no personal or family history of melanoma. On pathology, we have here a three millimeter punch biopsy. And we see that there is 
a, a component in the dermis that is well nested and appears to be maturing and quite bland. Um, so definitely a nevus component here. But then overlying that at the junction, there's just a lot of architectural and set, architectural disorder in cytologic atypia. So there's you know, dysplastic features here, um, larger nests, bridging of the nests, um, some areas of pagetoid scatter, cells that are enlarged with dusty cytoplasm, that uh, kind of dysplastic look. And another dogma in dermatopathology, if something is dysplastic on the face, you should really immediately stop and think twice about it. Dysplastic on the face is bad news. You shouldn't get dysplastic nebi on the face. Um, so I'm already very, very worried here. Um, then in, in, in this area here, um, where again, it's quite irregular at the junction, some horizontal bridging, I'm trying to convince myself, and I do this sometimes when I'm looking at cases, like, but she's young, it's on her face, this can't be a melanoma, maybe, maybe this is a recurrent nevus, maybe this is pseudomelanoma, right, when you have a traumatized mole, or a mole that's previously been biopsied, or, you know, scratched or, bi or you know, had a scar for any other reason, overlying the scar, you can have really marked atypia, architectural and cytologic, that can mimic melanoma, it's called pseudomelanoma, or recurrent nevus phenomenon, so I'm like trying to convince myself, are there kind of some features of a scar in the superficial dermis? Maybe she had trauma to this nevus before and doesn't know it. Um, again, trying to convince myself that this young girl does not have a melanoma on her face. This is, you know, kind of where I am right now based on the routine uh, histology. So of course, I'm going to work this up with IHC. This case, um, interestingly, is from 2018. So this was before Prane was commercially available. Um, so at the time, I was doing MART and MART and MITF or SOX10, I can't remember, um, but I would do kind of one cytoplasmic marker, one nuclear marker, just to kind of get a good rounded look at the melanocytes. And so starting with our MART here, oh, excuse me, hang on. starting with our MART here. So um, on MART, again, we can see um, it's highlighting all of our melanocytes. There's really irregular nesting, there's pagetoid scatter. So kind of showing us pretty much exactly what we saw on the H&E. And um, MITF is a nuclear marker now showing us pretty much the same thing. So really irregular junctional component, the dermis component looks okay. Um, for interest, um, knowing that I'm presenting this here today, I went out, ahead and did a, a retro frame on this case. So I pulled it and, and did a frame. Um, and this is the, the frame, and you can see the dermis dead negative, right? So that confirms the, the melanocytes in the dermis are okay. But our junctional component, as we kind of um, zoom in here, our junctional component does have um, frame positivity, including these kind of larger atypical cells. And so this is kind of corroborating our, our findings of really atypical at the junction, um, okay in the dermis. But again, she's 22. This is on her face. Before I make this call, I want to know as much as I possibly can. Can I step this back? Can I call this, you know, severely atypical or do I have to call this a melanoma? This is three millimeters on her face. That's unusual. Three millimeter melanoma on the face of a young person is not a common scenario for melanoma. So I really want to step away. I do. And so this was the original kind of report that I had at the time. Again, it was only Martin and MITF at the time. Um, and um, what this doesn't say here is that um, the comment actually started with this case was reviewed at Compass Dramatic Pathology Consensus Conference. This was one where I took it to my colleagues. You know, um, I, I took it from one job site to another job site to show it to my colleagues. Um, and, you know, we came to the agreement that it looks, you know, we were all like in a, in a 22 year old, we can't, you know, we're hesitant to call melanoma, you know, maybe it's dysplastic with severe atypia, but in this location, dysplastic nevi are considered highly suspicious for melanoma. Um, we asked, you know, is there a history of procedure or trauma at this site? Some of it might be related to that. Um, but if no such history exists, it's, we can't exclude the possibility of melanoma in situ arising in a nevus. Now, who likes that report? Nobody likes that report. What do you do with that, right? Do you tell this lady she has a melanoma? Do you tell this young girl she has a melanoma or do you tell her that it's a severely atypical lesion? Perfect case to, you know, send and get some additional information. And so this, and, I said, back in 2018, yeah. And you're highlighting, you know, you're doing a comprehensive workup and thinking clearly about this case. And it's in that context that you're thinking about, you know, do you turn to other genetic 
te other testing modalities. I, I think it's just a really important point. Like you, you talk about bringing it to consensus, thinking with your colleagues, right? Yeah. And, and, and and in this particular case, wanting to get additional levels of clarity. I think that's like that's it's hard to capture that that moment or that feeling, but it sounds like you 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 encountered it with your your group there about wanting to get more information. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, this was like 2018. So I believe the test was still owned by Myriad at the time when we ordered it. Um, but it came back with a low positive score. So um, this, uh, the my path result was positive 1.5. And so this was enough to kind of say, okay, we have to call this. So final report is melanoma in situ arising in a compound nevus um, on, unfortunately on the face of this young girl. And so just to kind of show you the outcome, you know, what, you know, <laughs> severe versus melanoma, okay, the outcome for this patient, um, normally a melanoma in situ is taken out with a one centimeter margin in most places on the body. On the face, of course, we want to be um, more conservative, right? We, we want to save as much skin as possible. So what's typically done in my practice, and I think in a lot of practices, is slow mos or a staged excision, where it's taken out with a smaller margin, um, a five millimeter margin instead of a centimeter margin. So this is a five millimeter margin around the lesion. And the slow mos style means we embed the all of the tissue edges on Fox. So I'm getting a 360 degree margin um, to clear um, versus bread loafing, which is what's done in a standard excision. Um, so because the margins are tighter, we're getting a, a complete 360 degree margin control. Um, but still a five millimeter margin, even on a three millimeter lesion leaves a significant defect. You can see that here. This is where they're planning the closure and you can see they did an advancement flap and O to L closure. And so this is a pretty sizable scar on a face of a young girl. Um, in preparation for this talk, I actually called her to ask her to make sure that it's okay to present her case. And I said, how has this diagnosis impacted you? And she said, well, at the time, because this was 2018, right? So we're about five years out. At the time, she was scared. She was a student. It definitely affected her ability to study. Um, fortunately, you know, she didn't stay behind or anything. She graduated. She's now um, works as a nurse um, in a children's hospital. She's doing great. The scars healed nicely, but the impact has lasted with her. She said that recently she had um, abnormal thyroid results on, on a routine blood test. And her immediate thought was, I have thyroid cancer. She's, you know, this is something that psychosocially having that diagnosis, it affects you. Um, I feel confident now having these results kind of backing my diagnosis that I didn't overcall this, that I think this really is a teeny tiny early melanoma caught early in a young individual, which is a, a, a positive thing. Um, but, you know, if I didn't have that test, I think part of me would always be wondering, did I name this person for no reason? Um, case six, we have a 70 year old male on the right instep. This has, this person has no personal or family history of melanoma and the clinical differential was, was acral nevus rule out atypia. And so this was biopsied and we have here, um, we see that it's on, on thick acral skin. There is a dermal component here that is really totally normal looking. That's our theme of the day, bland melanocytes in the dermis. Um, but in the overlying um, uh, dermoepidermal junction, there's a more irregular lentiginous proliferation of melanocytes, a few cells going a little bit high up in the epi. That being said, acral, acral nevi are considered special site nevi. That means that there are some atypical features that we kind of allow in this area. We say, okay, it's just because it's on this area. Um, and uh, in, in acral nevi, in, in nevi on the bottom of the hands or, or feet, the palms or soles, they tend to get a little bit of hadgetoid scatter, a little bit of something that in another area we would not be okay with, we can be okay with here. That being said, I usually will stain my acral nevi because I want to get an idea of the exact extent. The lentiginous component is hard to see um, on H&E alone, so I want to kind of get a sense of where exactly those melanocytes are, are they well organized, exactly how much pagetoid scatter is there, make sure that it's all kind of within reason um, before I just call it benign. So we have, here is our mark stain. And again, we have um, that component that's in the dermis, but then a slightly kind of asymmetrically uh, placed overlying lentiginous proliferation. And that lentiginous proliferation, um, has, you know, um, 
kind of dendritic uh, melanocytes. The, the melanocytic dendritic processes appear relatively uniform in their size and length. So that's important because in acral indigenous melanoma, you get kind of thick and thin dendrites. So this is all kind of reassuring. There's very, a little bit of low level cagetoid scatter, but most of it is pigmented pseudoperikeratosis. So overall, I'm very reassured and I'm like, great, April nevis, next case, right? But Prem, <laughs> we have completely negative in the dermal component, but our junctional component, pretty strongly Prem positive. All of those junctional melanocytes are giving me a strong nuclear signal here. So this is a case where I ordered IHC where I wish I didn't. And this happens, I think, to every pathologist. You know, we want things to kind of back our judgment. And, you know, um, acral nevi have some atypical features. And we want to kind of say, yep, I see the atypical features. I'm making a note of them. But it, don't worry, it's okay on this site. But here I have this claim telling me something else. And so, it, yeah. It's like standing yourself into a corner is what I would often say. Like, you kind of put yourself into a spot that you, you didn't really want to find yourself in almost. Exactly. Yeah. This is where I'm like, if I hadn't ordered this stain, it would be easier. <laughs> and so now um, we're stuck with this frame. And so um, here's where I am, right? My preliminary diagnosis here is an acral compound nevus with mild atypia and aberrant frame expression, right? So I'm saying, you know, 90% of benign things are frame negative, but that means 10% are going to be frame positive. And I'm thinking that this is one of those cases where for no good reason, it's frame positive. And um, that being said, I know that if I sign this out and I just give this to my provider, they're going to be like, what do, what do I do with this? You know, you're telling me it's frame positive though. You know, what, what do I do? And so, you know, do I cut it out because it's frame positive? And for this patient, I don't want them to cut it out. So I would love for there to be something that can confirm that, yes, this is a variant frame expression and this is benign. And so I went ahead and I sent, um, you know, for molecular here. Um, I should mention that this is actually the slide that I sent to Castle. Um, one nice thing um, Dr. Goldberg mentioned in the standard operating procedure that the first step when Castle receives the slides is that there is a board certified dermatopathologist pathologist that reviews the slides to make sure that there's enough tissue, enough lesional cells, and they're the ones that actually determine and uh, micro dissect out the lesional cells for testing. So what you can do if you have um, a specific component in your biopsy that you're worried about, you can actually circle that for the pathologist so that when they're doing their micro dissection, they can focus on the area of interest. This is helpful in an example of if you're worried about a, an inside to arising in a nevus or if you have a mixed population of things, a combined nevus or combined melanocytic proliferation you can circle the area of interest. So I, what I did here was I circled just the junctional component. I told them, ignore ignore the kind of the bulk of these kind of bland dermal nevus cells. I don't want those to dilute away the prime positive cells, which are the area of interest, right? So I'm, I just want testing of the junction. And this came back um, minus 3.1, benign. So I was very happy because I was able to give my final report um, of acral compound nevus with mild atypia and aberrant frame expression, but with an with a attached molecular result showing it's benign. And then my final note is due to the presence of frame positivity, it'd be prudent to watch this site and consider removal if anything comes back where it recurs, if there's anything left. Um, I'm still respecting the frame, you know? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't wanna say to this patient, good luck, never come back to the dermatologist, but this is a 70 year old man to have surgery on his foot is no small deal. I mean, a full thickness excision here um, could result in a non-healing sore, all sorts of problems, right? Um, so I'm really happy that we are just gonna be observing this lesion. The final case that I have tonight is a 32 year old male on the posterior upper arm. This came in with a clinical differential of rule out dysplastic nevus versus melanoma with a note to expedite it. So, you know, I know my providers and this is not somebody that puts rule out melanoma on everything. I call that like the boy who cried melanoma. Um, so this, this person really, you know, only puts melanoma when they're actually thinking this is, there's a good chance this is a melanoma. And so um, they're expediting it, they're that worried. So I'm already like, you know, red, red flags raised. Um, they took a dermatoscopic photo for me, which is great. Um, we can see here dermatoscopically 
This has a combination of pink and brown, which I don't love, slightly irregular border. And then there's kind of a suggestion of maybe like a negative pigment network. Um, if you're you know, studying dermoscopy, that's kind of considered um, a, a clue to melanoma. So no, no wonder this, he was concerned about this. Probably this was also growing. I think for, you know, for the non-dermatologist pathologist, those soft signs where your clinician alerts you, even in the, sometimes we don't get the richest text, you know, for the the clinical information, but those are signs that, you know, the diagnosis may be really critical for the patient or the, the, di the impact of our diagnostic report may be more impactful. I think uh, that, you know, you're launching a new children's book here, The Boy Who Cried Melanoma, I like that, but, it, <laughs> but it really, it's an important sign to kind of key into like when it matters even if you don't know the full clinical context, those are really important clues to, to highlight, I think, when clarity might really matter. I like that. Yes. Um, and so this is the, the biopsy. And just even on low power, there's something super weird about this. So on low power, it doesn't even jump out at me as something necessarily melanocytic. What's really jumping out at me is this prominent epidermal hyperplasia. It's really markedly acanthotic and irregularly acanthotic, um, the epidermis. And um, only when we kind of zoom in on there, do we see that in this really hyperplastic epidermis, we have all sorts of these bizarre, enlarged, irregularly shaped melanocytes with amphiphilic kind of grayish, hazy cytoplasm, large nucleo nuclei, prominent nucleoli. Again, the cells that are kind of looking back at us. And um, when they have, you know, abundant amphiphilic cytoplasm, that's kind of considered morphologically a so-called spitzoid feature, in addition to the epidermal hyperplasia is a spitzoid feature. When we look down in the dermis, we see that the cells have a very similar phenotype to our junctional cells. So again, these have abundant and large expanded amphiphilic cytoplasm and eyeballs looking back at us, okay? So spitzoid junctionally and spitzoid dermally. Um, and there was a, an, an inflammatory infiltrate associated with it. Here we see those enlarged spitzoid cells in the nests going really, really high up. So, you know, prominent kind of progetory to spread of melanocytes in this lesion. So clearly worried, we need to check this out more. Here is our IHC. So um, first up we have, I believe a Kmart. Yes, so Kmart, um, what I love, lovingly call KI67 Mart uh, duplex stain. So nuclei um, that are in the proliferative stage are stained brown and the cytoplasm uh, of specifically melanocytes will stain red. So this lets us see, you know, the melanocytes really well, but it also lets us see the proliferative index in the melanocytes. So first, just looking at the mark component, again, we're seeing that, that pagetoid scatter, um, irregular nesting, lots of single cells. And then we take a closer look at the dermis and we're kind of reassured here in the duplex stain again, um, you can see that in the um, the basal keratinocytes and um, the basal cells in our hair follicle, which are proliferative, proliferatively active, um, are brown, whereas the nuclei in our melanocytes in the dermis are not brown. So that means that these are not proliferative. It has a low proliferative index. That's reassuring. So I'm happy about that. Oops. Um, Then we have um, next up is a um, P16. So I like P16 for spitzoid things because um, technically uh, P16 expression loss can be a clue to a spitzoid melanoma versus a benign spitz. Another reassuring feature here. So this has retained expression in both the junctional and the dermal components. So diffuse P16 positive, that's you know reassuring. And now again, here comes Prame. And I'm like, come on, Prame, be negative. And the Prame's just kind of like, meh. It like doesn't want to commit. Um, in some areas, we have you know um, a prime positivity in even the dermal melanocytes, some of which are kind of large and atypical, right? Those spitzoid melanocytes. Some of them are positive, some of them are not. Um, we look at our junction, and again, we have some positivity in enlarged melanocytes. Again, it's not the strongest positivity ever, but it's not the weakest either. It's somewhere in the middle. So again, our prime is kind of in between here. And so here we're um, in a situation where we have a compound melanocytic proliferation with spitzoid features. Now, um, spitzoid lesions, you always wanna take into account the patient's age, the site, things like that, right? Does the clinical fit for a spitz nevus? And in this case, um, the patient in his 30s, he's a little bit old for a spitz, right? In, in a child, we're, we're fine with spitz. But in an adult, you start to get worried. Um, and it's not 
the best site for a spitz either, the posterior upper arm spitz, you know, commonly happens on the thigh, um, especially in, in more common in women. And so he's not quite fitting this, the pure benign spitz, you know, category. There are atypical features on the routine pathology. So I'm kind of like, could I definitively rule out that this is a spitzoid melanoma in this person? And the stakes here are significant because we saw again, that dermal component is the same as a junctional component. So if I say this is a spitzoid melanoma, we're talking about a Bresler depth 0.7 millimeter melanoma, that's gonna get us a one centimeter excision down to the fascia of the, the muscle, okay? So it's invasive melanoma, higher stakes here. Um, you know, I would really like to just say, no, this is a spitzoid thing, cut it out, but we don't have to go the melanoma down to the muscle route here. Um, so we have um, a molecular test ordered and came back negative 2.6. And I was able to confidently call it an atypical compound nebus with spitzoid features. Um, again, running theme here, doesn't mean benign, leave it alone. Given the routine findings and the, the worrisome features that we discussed already clinically, this needs to come out, but just make sure it's all out and it doesn't come back. We don't need to cut out a huge chunk of his arm. And so he actually just came in for suture removal last week, and this is his arm. Um, after the surgery, you can see he's had a little bit of an adhesive allergy to his band-aid, a little geometric shape there. Um, but the scar is relatively small. They took it out with not a huge margin. They didn't go down to the muscle near a joint here where that can really kind of affect him, right? So he had a small excision to make sure this funny looking mole doesn't come back. And I'm confident that it's gone, but I'm also confident that I didn't overcall a melanoma here. That's, I think, the last case, and I'm ready to take questions if there are any. Yeah, and again, I think these cases are are, are outstanding, Dr. Shkopsky, and thank you for sharing sharing them here tonight with the uh, with the group. And then for those who are going to view um, offline or online rather after the session uh, has been recorded, this last case also really highlights that you're 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 interpreting these results in the context of everything that you know, right? And so, and, and it, you're you're thinking really clearly, and I, and I think you articulate it really well about how it fits in as a valuable piece of information to guide well-informed treatment plans for the patients that we treat in partnership with our dermatology colleagues. And um, I really appreciate that insight um, and really just sharing these cases with the group. Um, we're at time, but if there are questions from those who have been here on the webinar, we'll be able to take them. And um, we can also follow up offline if people have questions in the chat that they can put in as well. So I'm not seeing any questions here in the chat, Dr. Skupski. Um, and so I, I really, again, just want to thank you for sharing these cases, participating with us tonight. If you have any you know, closing remarks, I think we'll, we'll end here after these seven cases, and this will complete kind of the fourth of our four initial cases with Castle. All right. And thank you so much for having me. Have a good evening, everybody.